Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to the CHIPS Method Seminar. Uh, today, we are very fortunate to have one of our own, Dr. Scott Kamalada. He's an associate professor in resident at UCLA Department of Bio of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and the co-director of CHIPS Method Core and the project lead of uh, UCLA ATN Analytical Core. So uh, Sky is a senior statistician, but today he's going to present our qualitative work. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Ming Shen. Let's stand over here. So it's true. I am a statistician. And they say the nice thing with being a statistician is you get to play in other people's sandboxes. <laughs> so if you'll bear with me today, I'm going to talk about qualitative data and do that. So I'm going to talk about perceptions around M health, barriers and benefits in South Africa. And this has application to other resource poor settings as well. I like this cartoon just because I kind of liked it, but then the more I thought about it, it's a very appropriate cartoon for M health. Because M health can be a really great vehicle for delivering health care, but at the same time, you have to keep your hands on the wheel because there's a lot of studies out there, a lot of technology, and it can get away from you quickly, and it can do as much harm as good sometimes. So, something to think about. So, first of all, I want to thank collaborators, as with any project, especially international projects. There's a lot of people involved. Uh, Human Sciences Research Council in South Africa, a whole team there. Uh, we've got University of Washington, Nithya Ramanathan, who used to be here at UCLA, now has her own company. And of course, our own Danielle Harris, two doors down, uh, helped out. Acknowledgements for grant support, um, NIMH, and some publications. One is published, another one in the works, and a lot of this will be based on that. So let's dive right in. Why should we do this study? What was the point of this qualitative study? Well, framing it around one of my favorite old westerns with Clint Eastwood, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, M Health has, there's a lot of good things about M Health. There's a lot of opportunities for healthcare delivery. HIV, this is a CHIP seminar, so I don't need to go into a lot of details on what a scourge HIV is, especially in South Africa, other resource poor settings. I'll just mention with South Africa have the largest total number of people living with HIV. The region where this study took place in KwaZulu-Natal, roughly one in four to one in five people are infected. So obviously a great need there. But the problem, the ugly, is that despite the potential for M Health to be used to combat HIV, other communicable diseases as well as diabetes, things like that, it hasn't really taken root as much as people as have hoped. Just in South Africa alone, I think I read recently that there's over, I don't know if it's 50 to 100 pilot studies around HIV going on at any given time around M Health. That's just South Africa. And, you know, I know uh, Dallas and Mary Jane wrote an article on pilotitis around all these different pilot studies. You know, when is enough enough? And so how do we get to that next stage with wide-scale adoption? We know what M Health can potentially do, but how do we put it all together and get to that next stage? So that's really one of the reasons for this study. You know, we can point to problems for scale-up for M Health. Obviously, infrastructure plays into it, but let's face it, there's a lot of in infrastructure in place already. In fact, I found this kind of interesting from the World Bank that Africa is actually investing more in information and communication technology infrastructure than for water and access to roads. So, I mean, there's a lot of technology out there, so infrastructure alone is not the answer. We need buy-in from stakeholders. You know, we need buy-in from health officials, from people in the clinics, from the field staff, and from the patients that are being served with these technologies. So we need to better understand, you know, what are their perceptions? 
what are the uh, benefits that they see, limitations, what are challenges around implementing this technology. And so that's kind of a broad spectrum reason for doing this qualitative study that I'm going to be talking about today. More specifically, this was done as part of formative work for an R21. And the R21 was tasked with developing an mHealth platform to link newly diagnosed people with living HIV to care through something we call home-based HIV testing and counseling. And so as the name applies, just to give a really brief overview of home-based HIV testing and counseling, it's very commonly used in South Africa and other places that are quite rural, resource poor, where homes are very spread out. Um, getting to the clinic is not very easy. A lot of people don't have transportation. Even when they do, the roads become bogged down very quickly when it rains and other things. And so you need to reach the people. You know, you can't just rely on them going to the clinic. So home-based HIV testing and counseling and fills in some important gaps. You know, one is identification. A lot of people just can't or don't go for medical checkups. So the field staff go out from the clinics, go to the homes, they offer rapid HIV diagnostic tests in the home. As well as if people are tested positive, they're given clinic referral cards to go to a clinic. They're given some information, HIV counseling, you know, the importance of going to a clinic. So this ties into identification and linkage along the HIV care continuum. I should mention too, if you have comments, questions at any point, just feel free to shout out, raise your hand. We can discuss. So this is a brief overview of the mHealth system that was set up for the R21 mHealth platform. The reason I'm showing this, I don't want to confuse too many topics, but I think in talking about the qualitative data, which I'll delve into a little bit, it's helpful to understand what is the end product that the qualitative data was informing. You know, what, what did we want to use it for? And it's really to figure out the best way to develop this M Health system to support the home-based HIV testing and counseling. So the basic idea was the field staff are deployed from the clinics, they go out to the homes, and they conduct this HIV testing and counseling. If people are tested negative, they're still offered counseling about the importance of being retested, you know, being aware and things like that. If they're tested positive, they're given a clinic referral card. And the idea is they're instructed to go to a clinic within a month of being tested for HIV. So where does the M Health component come in? Well, if people go to the clinic within the month, then the next step during their initial visit is they're given HIV medications. They're given a one month supply and they're asked to return within a month to refill their HIV medications. So there's several points along this continuum where breakdowns can occur. Of course, if they don't go to the clinic within a month, we want to know that to send field workers back out. So what happens is the field staff get an SMS alert on their phone that this person has not gone to the clinic. And we know that because there's also an M Health system in the clinic as well as the handsets that the field workers carry around. And so when patients go to the clinic, they're enrolled in the system, and that keeps track of who has gone and who hasn't. So the field staff get these alerts, and then they can go back out to the home, follow up, and find out why people haven't gone to the clinic, hopefully assist them. But even if they go to the clinic within the month, uh, yes, did you? I can wait, or you can answer it later, but just I know you guys have done a lot of work with Tamagi and other, um, and you know the landscape here. I'm just wondering, are there other uh, platforms or technologies that do things like this? Um, you can just talk about this in the context. Yeah, no, sure. Now's a good time to talk about it. So we are using Demagi for this one. Um, there's also the platform we're using for the 
I'm sorry, we're using an old Benzie here. It makes it in my platform. So Demagi is what we're using for the Adolescent Trials Network studies. But Demagi also works in South Africa and all over the world. Uh, for this one, we used Mobenzi, the South African company, and there are several others that do this type of thing as well. Um, as far as I know, the Department of Health, they do have some of their own pilot programs going on, but nothing wide scale as of yet. And so they're working with some of their own platforms. There's something else called Tier.net which is an electronic system that's kind of dying a slow death, as one person put it to me, unfortunately, but that's something that's used in South Africa. As, as so I remember well. hearing about um, you know, text message reminders for um, medication adherence and things like that that have been going on, but it sounds like those are not implemented uh, those are not widely used. Not on a wide scale, and this gets at an earlier point in the continuum. I feel like those programs have been more successful because there's been a focus on people once they're into care. This is focused on people who are, are testing or not into care yet. So, I mean, that's certainly important to keep them engaged in care, but this is getting at an earlier point in the continuum. So that's, yeah, that's a good question. And then so, of course, with the um, HIV medications, the same thing if they don't re come back and refill the prescription, so that's logged in the system, the field staff get an SMS alert and they can go back out to the home again. So again, this is really to give you a, a roadmap of where we're going with the qualitative data, you know, why we wanted to collect it to inform the development of this, yes. I'll just say, just because that was brought up, the key thing here is the, I think, is the SMS notifications to the field staff for follow-up. Mm -hmm. And that was the key point in those uh, meta-analyses of the adherence interventions um, that used SMS in Sub-Saharan Africa. There were several trials that used meta-analyses. All kinds of content, short form, long form, messaging, yeah. this and that. And, and, the, and the key factor that was the most important thing was a field staff being notified mm -hmm. and doing a follow-up. Yeah. So yeah, I just no. wanted to kind of reinforce yeah, that that is the main yeah, yeah, thing. There's really the integration is. with care. A, I yeah. mean, in some ways, it seems like such a simple thing. And you say, well, really, is that all there is to it? But it's just not being done on a wide scale. So some details on the qualitative study. You know, the, the point of the R21 is really a feasibility study and developing the platform, would people use it? So that's what the basis of the study was, and the qualitative study was to inform the development of the platform. So who did we actually talk to? Well, we did key informant interviews with five health officials. We, it was a very percursive sample of health officials that had been involved in M Health projects, so they had some familiarity. We also did focus groups with field staff connected to other research projects. A lot of them had some M Health experience. And then we also did focus groups with community health workers, which was a mix. Some had some experience with M Health projects, others not so much. So this was done in 2016 in KwaZulu Natal. So it's important to distinguish, you might ask, well, what's the difference between the research field staff, community health workers? In South Africa, they make a very clear distinction, and it's kind of debatable. There's task shifting that's going on, but as it stands right now, it's basically any diagnostic tests. The, the medical checkups and things are generally done by nurses that are part of the research field staff and the community health workers provide more of the counseling and support. So they might go out and visit somebody in the home and say, well, you don't look so well, you should go to a clinic, or, you know, let's get a nurse to come and check you out. But they don't do the testing themselves. So that's why we wanted to get representation from both groups of people. It's not that one is less important than the other. It's just this is the current setup, the way it's really works. So talking a little bit about the data collection analysis, you know, we did the interviewer, the key informant interviews with the health officials in English. 
focus groups were done in Zulu, the language that most of the people speak in that region. For topics, it was kind of directed. You know, we, we did it with focus groups and interviews where we left some of it open, but it was semi-structured. We wanted to know benefits and challenges that people saw with the current home-based um, programs, how they currently use technology. We also wanted to know what are mHealth features they would like to see and what are benefits and challenges that they foresaw, what are benefits and challenges with current methods of patient identification, and I'll talk about identification in more detail and why that's a really important issue, and then specifically benefits and challenges of biometric identification, and again I'm going to talk about that in more detail and why that's really important. Then lastly, conversations were transcribed into English. The transcripts were analyzed by two investigators, myself and Danielle, and then the themes are based on a conceptual model. So as with most qualitative studies, it's good to have a conceptual model to kind of ground your questions in, you know, to decide what you ask. I won't spend a lot of time on this, just, just to give you an overview. So this is a model specifically for mHealth systems, and it's based on the idea is that people's satisfaction with the system, their perceived satisfaction, has to do with the quality of the system, and the quality of the system can be broken down into three main components. I'm going to talk about each of these a little bit more, too, as I go through the qualitative data. But the first one is the quality of the system itself. You know, how reliable is it? Does it provide patient privacy? Things like that. Another part of it is the interaction. When you have to interact with the system, it might be really reliable, but it might not be that easy to interact with. It might be kind of clunky. So that's another important point. And then the third one is what kind of outcomes do you get out of the system? You know, does it meet the needs of what you're looking for. So for the remainder of the seminar, I'm going to talk about kind of the specific themes and how the qualitative data really groups into these themes. And really a lot of the slides, I just want to show the actual words of the participants because I feel like with qualitative data, that's where the richness really comes in in their own words. You know, what are they saying? And I also want to show how the qualitative data was used to actually inform the design of the platform. Because I feel like that can be lost sometimes. We say, okay, we collected this qualitative data. It's cool, but what did we actually do with it? So I want to show that indeed we actually used it. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about interaction quality, that theme, you know, interacting with the mHealth its system itself. And what were some what are some issues around home-based counseling, HIV testing and counseling in areas where participants said, you know what, I think an M Health system could improve my interaction with the infrastructure overall. So one of the themes that kept emerging, and it was interesting because this wasn't even a direction we tried to take things, but it just kept coming up, and so we thought it was worth talking about. There's a lot of frustration with both the research staff and the community health workers that they get deployed from clinics, and you know the way it's set up is they have these rough catchment areas that they operate within. You know, it might be bounded by roads and different structures, and they get sent out, and they're supposed to visit homes in these areas. But, you know, unlike homes here, they don't have physical addresses a lot of times. You know, they can be informal housing, more formal, and it can be very frustrating for them. You know, they go out trying to find these homes, trying to find their way back to the homes when they have to do follow-up visits, and there's a lot of duplication of efforts, as one of the uh, research staff members said. You know, sometimes I go to a home, and someone else has already been there, so I just wasted a lot of time walking to that home. 
I should say the staff members have the benefit of vehicles a lot of times, although when it rains, those don't do a lot of good. The community health workers are usually on foot. So that, um, you know, the issues of having to go back out to homes and things, it's especially relevant for the community health workers. So what did we do about this? Well, this was it's kind of cool. We, this led to the development of the, actually a mobile mapping app based on Google Maps. Now, I would love to take some credit. I can't take any credit. My um, co-PI in the study, Alistair, who's very good with tech and all that, he actually you know, thought of this and put this app together, which is pretty cool. So you might look at this and say, well, this just looks like Google Maps to me. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is, again, in the US, when you think of how you use Google Maps, you put in a physical address. You don't have to do that here. These are not physical addresses. The way it works is you can input structures into the map that don't have a physical address and tag those structures. And you can use those as waypoints to guide the field staff as they go out to the homes. So I thought that was pretty nice. Another really cool thing about it, which again, it sounds simple, but quite useful is when you've been to a home, you can tick off that home, and if you click on it, you can pull up more details about having visited the home. So it addresses another need that was brought up by the focus groups that, hey, you know, we're duplicating efforts here. So this was a pretty cool development, I thought, and definitely one of the high points. Another thing that people brought out, and I mean, this is really the main reason why we developed this platform. It's kind of validation is the need where these are uh, health officials that said this, but we've had these same comments from health officials to community health workers, research field staff, and they basically said the people go out to the homes, the field staff, but once they test them, they have no way to know if they went to the clinic. You know, eventually they might go back out for a follow-up visit, but that could be months later. They have no way of knowing if they went, and it was a big frustration for them that kept a theme that kept coming up over and over again. So it was definitely validation for developing the platform that such a thing was needed. And again, here's more comments. You know, when we were asking them, what are things you would like to see in an mHealth system? What's important to you? This theme kept coming up is, we need to know when we test people, what happens? You know, do the people go to the clinics or not? This was kind of interesting too, is it reiterates the point that, you know, you might say, well, can't they just call people up? You know, why do we need this notification system? Why do they need to go back out and visit them? Well, as we found out, a lot of people said, well, just calling them up, it doesn't really work. Sometimes people say, like this one person said, you call a person, you know it's them, but they say there's somebody else. Or, you know, and so they basically said, you know, we need to physically follow up with people. So that's a big problem, too, is it's very intensive with resources to send everybody back out. So what do you do with that? So it really speaks to a big motivation for the platform, and this idea that, well, if we know when people go, we don't have to send field workers back out for everybody. We only need to send them back out for the people who don't go. And so just to talk briefly about some of the things we found from the feasibility study, you know, not surprisingly, we found about half of the people linked to care within six weeks, which is a little bit longer than the proposed um, time frame of one month. And we found, you know, close to a quarter that once they were in care, that they didn't pick up their one month um, HIV medication refill. So, you know, it shows that we don't need to send people back out for everybody. And by knowing who has gone and who hasn't, these percentages are based on the M Health system telling us which people went and which didn't. 
we can better target the efforts of the field staff and the community health workers. So that's a really cool thing with that. Now this next set of comments, it touches something on that Sean brought up. And unfortunately, our study did not get to this point. We focused on identification and linkage as home-based HIV testing and counseling also does. But there was also frustrations with when we talk to the people living with HIV themselves that I go to the clinic, if I go on the wrong day, they can't see me, I forget my appointments, you know, I need a reminder, I need to know when to go. So there's obviously still a need um, for, you know, people to get reminders on their phones, you know, as Sean mentioned, and this is not a wide scale thing that's available as evidenced by these comments. You know, people want something like this, so it's definitely needed. So let's talk about a very particular aspect of confidence, which you might not think about when you see our friend Charlie Brown. I don't know why that, that image came to mind with confidence, but it did. So one of the really cool things that came out of this when we asked the groups, you know, what are benefits, challenges you think about with mHealth systems, the community health workers said, I think that this could lead to better trust between the clinic staff and us, you know, between the health officials and us. And when we got into the details of why they thought this could lead to better trust, it was around things like if you have a system in place that leads to better communication between the clinic staff and the field staff, it would streamline that communication and there would be less finger pointing when things went wrong. You know, like this one comment says, when they send the uh, field staff out, the field staff can't find a home or something, there's finger pointing, you know, like you didn't do your job, you didn't go where you're supposed to. So if we have better navigation for the field staff, there's a system to know when people go to the clinic, there's more accountability, this could actually improve trust. I didn't put that comment up here, I guess, but there was one that actually used the word trust. We felt, we feel like the system can improve trust with community health workers. And it's interesting because there is a whole body of literature around community health workers and how they need to be validated more for their efforts. You know, a lot of times they feel underappreciated and there's kind of this tension between the trained medical staff and the community health workers, many of which are not even paid for their time. They do it because they want to help people in their community and so they felt the system could actually, you know, improve relationships with the trained medical personnel. So that was a cool element we didn't anticipate, and it kind of validated the system. So I'll talk about platform quality a little bit. Uh, one of my favorite <laughs> movies of all times, um, Back to School, with Rodney Dangerfield. <laughs> So platform quality, so some of the interesting things around this, it's probably not terribly shocking, is that people said, look, people are already using their own ad hoc mHealth systems. You know, they're using WhatsApp to share patient information. They're actually taking pictures of x-rays and things like that with their own phones and sharing information between other medical staff. And so they're taking this bottom-up approach to mHealth, as it's been called in the literature, to fill in these gaps. So obviously this is bad. You know, if you're sharing on public devices, there's issues around patient privacy. In the literature, there's been talk about, they call it geographic. Um, this accentuates geographic inequalities, socio-demographic inequalities, because obviously medical staff in poorer areas don't have these personal devices themselves, or if they do, this puts a heavier burden on them to pay for these devices and share information. So again, it's another justification that we need more formal systems in place. Not that our R21 is going to solve this, but you know, moving in that direction that we need to push for more mHealth solutions. 
So I want to spend some time around platform quality talking about patient identification. So why is this important and why did we focus on this so much? Well, in order for an M Health system to work, when you identify somebody in the home and enroll them in the phone, you need a patient tracker. And that has to be linked to a clinic system somewhere. And so coming up with a unique patient tracker has proved to be a rather difficult issue. And it's one reason that um, there's been a lot of problems with these different systems, to be quite honest. There, there's been success where, for example, if people go to the same clinic and there's a clinic system and there might be a biometric scan like a fingerprint, and then when that person comes back to the same clinic, they scan their finger again. Those types of systems are pretty robust and they seem to work pretty well, but patients are coming back to a fixed location. The thing that hasn't worked so well and needs to be worked out is what do you do when you test people in a home? They might move and then you know they may or may not go to that designated clinic. So the patient identification part is very tricky. So current options in South Africa, I mean obviously name and surname, that's a basic piece of information collected during the home-based HIV testing and counseling. Physical addresses, mostly everybody has mobile phones now so you can collect numbers but they change so that's an issue. South African ID, that's kind of like the social security card in the United States but not everybody has a South African ID, so that's an issue there. Something we were particularly interested in is biometric identification. There's been a lot of pi pilot programs in India and different countries on using everything from fingerprint scans to iris scans. And there's been different studies. Fingerprint scans are probably the most ubiquitous just because they seem to be fairly robust, the technology is pretty inexpensive. And so that's the direction we went for our study based on feedback from the qualitative interviews as well as what we could do. But talking a little bit more about identification from the focus groups and key informant interviews, what were thoughts and perceptions that people had? Well, there was a general agreement that you know, we need better identification in place. Um, you probably need to collect multiple types of identification because people use other people's names. You know, whether on purpose or not, they might misspell their name, they might change the name or whatnot, and so the name alone is certainly not enough. Um, this one was kind of interesting, even with the South African ID, if you try to use one piece of information, you know, it's kind of like social security cards in the U.S. People use other people's numbers and things like that. There's a criminal element involved in that. So there's an issue around that as well. So with biometric identification, we specifically asked about perceptions because people have varying ideas of what biometric identification is. Everything from, you know, nice to minority report. Not so nice. So what did people really think about that? Well, overall we found people are pretty positive about biometric identification. I mean, some of the people living with HIV didn't really know what it was, but when we explained it, they were kind of like, oh, okay, I could kind of see that. We didn't get a single consensus on whether they would prefer fingerprints, iris scans, or some other form. There seemed to be a mix of opinions. I mean, interestingly enough, I don't know if I have a slide on here, no, I don't have it. You know, some people said that um, bio, uh, fingerprint scans are collected to get your uh, payments, your retirement payments at the bank, and so they were a little bit wary about that being used for, you know, patient identification. Other people were fine with it. Some people said iris scans. Other people were like, oh, I don't know about that. So there was not a general consensus, but overall it was pretty positive. So the solution we came up with for the R21 platform is just to accommodate multiple forms of identification. At the minimum, you had to use a name and surname, but 
you could provide other pieces like a fingerprint scan, ID, or mobile phone number. What we actually found in the study is that about three quarters of the people had a South African ID, so that was pretty encouraging. All but two provided a mobile phone number. The fingerprint scans, interestingly enough, everybody was willing. We didn't have anybody that wouldn't do it, but the mobile scanning devices themselves didn't work so well. So that was really disappointing. And I think, you know, there's a number of reasons for that. One is that, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the successes have taken place in fixed locations where you come into a clinic, there's a system there. We were operating in the field. Another thing that we tried to push the boundary a bit is fingerprints are used for authentication, not identification. So the difference being they're used now where if Dallas comes in, I say, okay, Dallas, let's verify who you are. That's verification and authentication. We were trying to push the boundary. Could we use this to uniquely identify people in of itself? So there was some programming involved and you know and all that. I don't understand all that. But basically there were some issues in that where the fingerprints it didn't read in the clinic initially, and there were, there were some issues. So we know this is an R21, it was exploratory, so we wanted to try and find out some of the issues around that. I think the promising thing is, you know, we were able to identify everybody. We allowed multiple forms of identification, and that's probably going to be the key overall to make this work. Some other things specifically about the system efficiency, as the theme calls it. People are pretty positive about mHealth, but in general, they said, you know, there's a need for training which is not surprising. Some people were more positive about training. They felt like a lot of people were already connected to different programs, like Mom Connect is one. Other people felt like they're a little bit more negative. But overall, it was pretty good. There were some other perceptions around, you know, they thought that coming in with phones would make people look more credible. Other people thought it would help the staff because they didn't have to carry as much paperwork. This one at the bottom is interesting. There's a drug called Wunga. So as a little side note, it's something where you smoke a combination of HIV medications with other drugs. I've talked to clinicians and they say HIV medications should not enhance the effects of other drugs, but there's this perception. So people steal the drugs and they, they do this. So there's these whole gangs around this drug. And, so some people were worried about carrying devices that were too nice because, you know, there's issues of theft and things, although we haven't had that specific problem. It was an interesting balance of some people preferred phones for the theft issue. They thought, you know, uh, tablets would be too easy to steal. The community health workers wanted tablets because they said, you know, we're older. It's harder for us to see the devices. They felt it would make them more respectable. So there's a differing opinions. In the end, we went with mobile phones. That was our thing. And I'll end by talking about outcome quality. You know, when we talked to the health officials, the key informant interviews, the big thing that they brought up where they thought an mHealth system could really help is going up all the way to the government level is obviously you need good data to make good decisions. And as the way they framed it now, there's a huge backlog of trying to get data from the clinics all the way up the food chain to the Department of Health so they could make decisions. So they really saw a big need for just quicker information flow in making decisions, you know, meeting epidemics as they emerge and knowing where to direct resources and things. And so that was definitely a big focus. Again, not something our R21 could specifically address, but, you know, an interesting thing to have an ongoing discussion around. There have been some areas of progress, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, especially in the rural areas like KZN, where we did the study, where the, there's just, we don't have the systems in place. As far as outcome quality, a lot of the discussion focused on 
benefits not related specifically to M Health, but I thought it was worth putting up here just to emphasize partly the work, the important role that community health workers play. And as a reminder that no matter how advanced technology gets, you can't take people out of the equation. They're still the most important part. I think um, Mark Tomlinson, one of our investigators in South Africa, he always stresses M Health is nothing without people. It's the people that make it work. M Health is only a little tool. So I think these slides, you know, here just talking about what the community health workers do. That's another one. That, you know, it just drives the point home. It's the people that really make the difference, and we need to find a way to get better tools into their hands. So where do we go from here? Well, this study, this qualitative study, was done at the beginning of a grant period to figure out how to design the system. Obviously, when you ask people about perceptions before they've even used something, they don't always know what they want, right? And so we need studies to be done at the end stage to, to better assess perceptions about continual use, you know, that they tend to use. I mean, we did have the benefit that some of our participants were engaged with technology already, so they can make pretty informed comments, but not everybody. So that's one of the plans for future studies to assess people at the end. Another thing, too, that Sean brought up earlier, we need a system that addresses different points along the continuum. This focused on linkage identification, but we also need to target other gaps like retention for people who are in care with things like SMS messaging and, and whatnot. And then lastly, you know, the qualitative data can only take us so far, obviously, and even the quantitative data by itself. If the quantitative data shows improvements, we need to know how much all this costs. And that's something that's been largely lacking with these M Health studies, both in the United States and abroad, probably even worse abroad. You know, this is brought out, I just cited one article, but there's numerous articles that talk about the need for cost effectiveness analyses. And if we're going to get buy in from Department of Health officials, we really need to show the cost benefits to get the buy in. And I think that's one area that we're lacking. But on a bright spot, I'm happy to say, you know, just in our research center here, we're getting more involved in cost effectiveness analyses. You know, for our ATN care study, that's an important point of all the studies we're doing. Ellen is involved in helping us get, helping staff to record their time through mobile apps and different things like that. So it's something coming down the pipeline, it's just not here quite yet in many instances. And that's basically it. Uh, questions, comments? Is there any privacy concern? There is. I mean, it's the same with the ATN CARE study, where study participants get text messages on their phones. These messages were going to field workers, but they're still SMS messages, so there's no real protection. So one of the things we do is, kind of like in ATN CARE, is we try not to have too much sensitive information. So like, for example, the field workers, they would get a message on their phone that would say ID such and such needs to be visited, it didn't actually say the patient name. So there are some safeguards like that, but it's, it's definitely a continuing issue. I have one. Um, you mentioned like a buy-in from the Department of Health. Are they, do they seem receptive and open to something like this, or are they so focused on kind of like the cost effectiveness where this really has to be beneficial to them like financially for them to be able to move forward? Yeah, that's a good question. It's kind of a mix. I mean, I think ultimately is going to be cost effectiveness, but at the same time, it's kind of that thing like, oh, here's something new. This is kind of cool. So in South Africa, there's a whole e-health directorate 
just focused on M Health and trying to get projects moving. But I feel like to get to that next stage, so the e health director can make their case, the cost effectiveness analyses have to happen. But we are, um, with our research group, we're trying to make our way in. You know, like with this person on the e health directorate, we include them as a co author in one of the papers. They're very happy about that. And so things like that to kind of work our way into the system and demonstrate the importance. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.